If you have managed to get onto the Helldiver servers, you know exactly what the Hellpot is, and it's awesome. But could the engineering behind something like this work in the real world? My name's Nate, I have a master's degree in engineering, and I'm here to spread managed democracy! So the first and most important step of engineering anything is determine its purpose. What's the purpose of the Hellpot exactly? Well, it's actually fairly straightforward when you dig into it. It's a single-use, orbital troop deployment vehicle. Or a suat dev Doesn't really roll off the tongue with that acronym, but that's okay, we'll let marketing deal with that one later. So, now that we know what we want our help out to do, let's look at how exactly we want to do it. Stepping through our horrendous acronym from earlier, let's look at that first section here, single use. Now, the fact that our help out here is going to be single use makes the engineering of this a whole lot easier. Take the humble soda can, for example. This is a single use product and a perfect example of one. It's just a thin aluminum can that you pop open once, drink the contents, and throw away. Preferably recycle it. But now try to think for a second how you would make that easily and reliably reusable. I gave it a little thought myself, but honestly, couldn't come up with anything really good for making that reusable and also reliable. So you know what, if you have a good way, that's honestly a million dollar idea right there. Go work on it, go get it patented. It's free patent hour with Nate. Take that one and run, I give it to you. And you know what, because I'm giving out free patents here today, I'd love if you consider leaving a like on this video, or maybe consider subscribing to see more of this absolutely feral engineering I'm doing here. But that's enough rambling about soda cans, there was a point to that analogy there. Our drop pod is essentially the soda can of orbital deployment. You use it once, and you throw it away. So, the next half of our acronym, the OATDIV half, is going to be much, much harder to engineer. Orbital means we're going to need this to survive re-entering the atmosphere of a planet. Troop deployment means it's going to need to deliver a soldier and all their gear safely to the planet and ready to fight. And vehicle means, well, vroom vroom. So now that we've established our purpose of the Hellpod, and we've established the requirements on how the Hellpod needs to operate, it's time to tackle our first problem here. Orbital entry. So the loading menu here is actually a fantastic example of what an orbital entry looks like, because that is exactly what the Hellpod is doing, and that's why I've even made this video. We're trying to establish how that works. But the fire you see in front of there really happens on an object entering back into a planet's atmosphere. Happens to little meteorites that go into the Earth's atmosphere, that's why they burn up, they encounter a lot of heat and air resistance, which we'll get into, and this was an issue they had to figure out for the Space Shuttle program and any other space program that was trying to get the astronauts safely back to Earth. So the first portion of our problem here is actually going to help the Hellpod out. Air resistance is going to cause drag on the Hellpod as it goes into the atmosphere, and this means it's going to bleed off a significant amount of speed and cause less impact on the poor little soldier inside the Hellpod that is impacting the planet's surface. Now, that air resistance is going to cause a massive issue for our Hellpod here. Even though air is a very minimally dense fluid, it is still a fluid that has a density, which means as it passes over our object, the Hellpod is going to create some friction. And not an issue if you're driving your car down the highway. Massive issue if you're hurtling towards a planet at thousands of meters per second. So, for example, the space shuttle, when it re-entered the atmosphere, experienced temperatures eh, around 1400 Celsius, so that's, um, a lot. It's also known as around the temperature steel melts. But seeing as astronauts have safely returned to Earth before, material science has an answer for this problem. What they did in the space shuttle program were they used ceramic tiles on the front of the shuttle. As the shuttle came in, these ceramic tiles that could withstand the extreme heat experienced during re-entry were taking the brunt of the heat and allowed everyone to land safely. And considering that Helldivers takes place in the far future where we have space travel technology, I'm going to assume they figured out how to make a composite that can withstand more heat than our current composites. So I'm going to say, as long as the leading edge of that little cone there has some good composites on it, problem solved. So, back to our acronym from earlier, we've actually solved the orbital problem already. Now the problem is the troop deployment. So we need to figure out how to not make the soldier inside be human pancake when this thing lands. So we're going to need to do a little math to figure out. And this math is going to be a lot tougher than before, we're going to need to do some real calculations here. First, we're going to need to calculate terminal velocity of the help pod. Terminal velocity being at the point which the drag caused by the air creates enough force that it brings the acceleration of the help pod to zero. And once that acceleration equals zero, that means our help pod will no longer be decelerating the atmosphere. Now you may be saying, how the hell do we calculate this? Well, I'll tell you what, luckily NASA has provided us with an equation. They've been a great benefactor to the Hellpod program so far. And this equation has a lot of variables, so let's break them down real quick. Looking at our terminal velocity equation here, we're trying to solve for Vt here, our terminal velocity, which is going to give us the square root of 2 times the mass times gravity over the density of the air times the surface area times the coefficient of drag. 
So we're going to start off by establishing our density of air as exactly equal to the density of air on Earth because I don't want to figure out the density of air of an entirely alien planet. So we're going to use 0.07 pounds per feet squared. Next up, we can knock out none of these variables easily. Oh dear. Okay, so we're going to have to figure out our weight here, which means we're going to need a lot of calculations. We're also going to need to figure out the frontal area, and we're also going to need to figure out that drag coefficient. So let's take a quick vote here on which variable we want to start with figuring out. Oh yeah, I'm the only one here. Um, I've decided we're starting with weight just because. So how are we going to solve for the weight of this thing? Well, I've been given no information. Tried looking up online, not a whole lot around. So we're going to break this thing up into two portions. The human tube and the little cone on the front. And with that, we're going to start with the human tube first, because this is going to also be a lot more difficult to solve. So what size is the hell pod? That's a fantastic question. How we're going to solve this I have this still image here for me dropping into a mission. Let's assume this Helldiver is six feet tall, just to make things easy. We can look at the Helldiver's height, work backwards, and see this circle on the bottom. That circle is visible as the Hellpod is dropping. So we have a constant here that we can use to measure the dimensions of this thing. So six foot tall Helldiver, and if we take this line and kind of just tilt it up, I'm gonna say that's five and a half feet. It's pretty close to there, but it's a little bit shorter. So this circle here is five and a half feet in diameter. So looking at the rear of our helipod here as it drops onto the planet, we see that same circle, which we know is five and a half feet in diameter. Let's take a line of one of these six sides. And if you move that over, it looks to me to be about two thirds of the length and doing some incredibly generous rounding. We're gonna say each side is three and a half feet, just to make things easy. So looking at the side view of the helipod dropping, Figuring out the height of this portion is going to be a little bit tougher. We can kind of see that same edge we measured, and we could maybe work backwards and use it, but pretty obscured by the fire. So we're going to do a little fudge in the numbers here. So saying from before, the cell diver we were looking at is six feet tall. We have to assume that not everyone's the same height. Let's say this can fit people up to like six foot six. They want to fit everyone in these things so that everyone can be a hell diver and spread managed democracy. So we need to account for that here. And we know there's a mechanism that shoots you up as you land. So there's got to be some sort of mechanical thing at the bottom there that we need to account for space for. So I'm going to say this thing is nine feet long. So we're counting for the extra six inches on top of our six foot hell diver, as well as like two and a half feet of random junk in the bottom. So now we've established our side lengths, we know our height, and we know how many panels we have. That means there are six panels that are three and a half feet by nine feet in length. So, oh, we need more things to calculate. Wait, we need to know how thick those panels are. So figuring out the thickness of our hell pod here is gonna be a little tough. There's no way we're getting a cross section of view of this hell pod. We can't cut this thing in half and look how thick the walls actually are. So we're gonna have to do some guessing here. Looking at the space shuttle again, the hull was up to 15 millimeters thick in some places. And since I don't know what a millimeter is, we're gonna convert that real quick. That's about six tenths of an inch. So that's a pretty hefty haul right there. Now, will that be enough for our hell pod is the question. Now, the space shuttle was designed to take astronauts to space, bring them back in re-entry, and land on a runway. Our hell pod's not landing on a runway. It is smashing into the planet at a high velocity, embedding itself in the ground, and bringing a person up. So we're gonna need a little bit thicker skin. Now, figuring out exactly what kind of strength we need there is pretty tough. So we essentially want this to embed in the ground and survive. So we're gonna kinda use a fudge factor here and just say, if you double that, that'll be pretty good because the main shock is gonna be on that bottom cone, not the sides. The sides just need to not get crushed in by the ground pushing its way back in. So let's just double it. Let's call it 1.2 inches. Now, if I were a help by designer, and this entire hypothetical, I am. I would probably pick titanium. Now the reason for this is it's lightweight, which is gonna help us later on with our landing calculations. And by landing, I mean smashing into the ground. It's about half the weight of steel, and also it can withstand the high temperatures of re-entry. This can withstand about 3000 degrees Fahrenheit before it starts to get all liquidy. And considering the re-entry before was about 400 degrees below that, I call that pretty good. So first, let's get a quick volume of one of these panels. We've got nine feet by three and a half feet by 0.1 feet thick, converting real quick from inches. That gives us 3.15 feet cubed. Now multiplying that by our density of titanium, 281, we get about 900 pounds per panel here. And we have got six of those, so that means we get a grand total weight for our human tube of 5,400 pounds. So with the weight of our man can solved, let's move on to that nose cone. First, let's figure out the drag efficient real quick because that ought to be fairly easy. And why, you may ask? It's an established factor. Now who established it, you may ask? 
I don't have the faintest idea, but entering textbooks use the value, so we're gonna use it too. Now, a 45 degree angle cone here has a coefficient of 0.5. And looking at our hell pod here, I would say that looks like kind of a rounded version of a 45 degree angle cone. And I'm not gonna calculate the actual curves of that, so that's a 45 degree angle cone now. So, looking at our 45 degree angle nose cone we've got here, this here is meant to just like penetrate into the ground, so we're gonna assume this is solid metal. If it was anything else, it'd probably crumple and not do its job properly. Now, what do we wanna make our nose cone out of? Again, this is to penetrate into the ground and break through hard rocks and buildings and whatever else it's going through. So we want something tough. Now, titanium's good, but I think there's better options. Let me introduce you real quick to the Mohs hardness scale. This ranks materials based on hardness, based on how hard they are compared to diamond, the hardest known material. So titanium on the scale is a six. That's good, but that's not great. There's a lot of things that are above that. So I think instead we're gonna use tungsten carbide. This is used to make a lot of cutting bits on machinery and stuff that makes other metal pieces. So this here, this is gonna make sure we go through anything we need to. And for finding our weight, we need to first find the dimensions of our cone here. This looks to be about the same height as it is width. And using that circle we found from before, we're gonna say the width is five and a half feet. So cut that in half, give us a radius of 2.75. Now enter our height width into the handy dandy volume calculator of a cone on Google because I don't want to do the math myself by hand. We get about 21.78, or if we round that up, 22, let's call it. Now we've got our volume, let's multiply that by the density of tungsten carbide here, which is about 1,071. Put that together, we get about 24,000 pounds for our nose cone. That's a hefty nose cone, but you know what? We need a hefty nose cone. Now, we need one more quick piece of info and we're ready to solve that terminal velocity equation. We need to figure out the cross-sectional area of that cone. This is a pretty simple one. We choose our radius, 2.75, gives us an area of about 24 we'll go with. Now we have every part we need to fill out this terminal velocity equation. And that gives us a final terminal velocity of the helipod of 1,475 feet per second, which is in fact, very fast. Now, you may be sitting there thinking to yourself, why is this guy even solving for the terminal velocity? The Hellpot has engines that pop out when you get close to the ground. You can use them to maneuver, and it slows you down when you land. You don't even need the terminal velocity. Does this guy just solve equations in his free time for fun? I tell you what, I do. But that's not the point here, okay? We actually needed that because we need to figure out how fast we're going when the engines slow us down. So now, how are we going to figure out how much these rockets actually slow us down? We don't know anything about the rockets. We don't know what kind of force they're outputting. We could calculate it if we knew the kind of force they were putting in the opposite direction, like we did with terminal velocity and drag, but I know none of that. So knowing no variables causes some problems. So considering this is hypothetical engineering, we're going to give it a fudge factor. And based on how the video looks when it kind of slows down when the rockets launch, we're just going to call that that it cuts the speed to a quarter of what it used to be. That sounds nice, I think. So cutting our terminal velocity in a quarter, that gives us about 370 feet per second. Now we're going to use that to calculate the g-force based on how long it takes for the pod to stop in the ground. So to calculate our final g-force that's put on our helldiver here, we're going to use the change of velocity over time times gravity. So now I record all my videos in 30 frames per second. And looking at this video here, as we step it through, we see the engines turn off at frame one. And then by about frame three, it looks like it stopped moving. So we're going to say that's one tenth of a second it takes to slow down. So take all these final factors, put them in the equation here. We get a g-force of about 114. That's a lot of g-force to put on a person. Looking up some random stuff online, it says in like a car crash, you can survive about 30 g's in an impact. Our hell diver is not doing too well here. Our hell diver is a pancake at the bottom of this hell pod. Why is the hero of managed democracy flat? Now, an important step in engineering is figuring out what went wrong. After you test something, and if it fails, it's important to work backwards and figure out what happened here. Now, why is our hell diver flat? We did all the math, we made a pod here, why is he still flat? Well, that's because this is a video game, and unfortunately it does not take into account the uh, fragility of the human body. Now, what's some areas we could change to actually make this thing work? If our goal is, say, 30 Gs to be survivable, we could cut down on weight, say, and that would reduce our terminal velocity, maybe make that nose cone hollow instead of fully solid. Maybe some real thick walls on that would do just fine instead of a complete solid cone. Or we could say the engines that pop out at the end are much stronger, and we need to put some stronger engines on this thing to really slow us down better. That would reduce our impact speed and then reduce Gs in the end. But at this point, we're making hypothetical changes to an already hypothetical high pod, so let's just call it here before this gets out of hand. If you enjoyed this, I'd love if you have a like down below, and if you want to see more of this type of content, I'd love if you hit that subscribe button. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Next time we return to spreading managed democracy, that is, LIBERTY!